Hello again, everybody, and welcome back to The Accelerator with Michael Conniff. That's me. We are a podcast dedicated and devoted to entrepreneurs, founders, startups, um, all, all kinds of uh, new businesses, and also the VCs, angels, family offices, and investment firms that serve them or that, I guess, try to make a lot of money from them. <laughs> more accurately. Um, but we are joined today, and I'm really happy to be joined by Diane Bailey, coming to us from Colorado Springs, uh, Colorado. She is the head of uh, the National Accelerator Program at Founders Institute, um, and also an entrepreneur in her own right, and also head of the, the Denver chapter of the Founders Institute. So welcome, welcome aboard, Diane. Great to have you. Thanks, Michael. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I think you being in Colorado Springs shows that really you can be anywhere these days in a, in a post-Zoom world, post-pandemic world, um, because you're running Denver from Colorado Springs, right? Right, right. Well, and it's only an hour away, so it's not um, not too right. too uh, dif too difficult to do that. But yes, um, what do you have against Colorado Springs? We can we can run anywhere, huh? I, I've, so I've, I've uh, no, Springs. like like being in Colorado, <laughs> like being in Colorado yeah. Springs, and uh, really like being involved in the Denver startup ecosystem. Uh, really, the whole state is just awesome when it comes to all the resources yeah, we have it's, here. It's a great place to be, despite the smoke from the fires in the summer, right? which we were just talking about. Yes. But let me, let me, and I also yes. say like you're not only in running Denver from Colorado Springs, you're running an entire worldwide global operation, which we will get to in a second. I wanted to start, Diane, by talking to you about your own uh, startup experience and kind of the exit that got you to where you are today that sort of got this ball rolling. So tell us about your early career and your first, um, your, your, your first startup, the startup that led to the exit. Sure. So my startup journey actually began after I was a mechanical engineer. So I had to have a big mind shift between going from an industry where mistakes were bad to an industry where mistakes are seen as experiments and is seen as a path to learning and a path to growth. So been there, done that, really like helping other entrepreneurs along that journey. And I think that because I have that personal experience, I'm able to help a lot more people in a more genuine way. So um, really back, oh gosh, it's probably been about 10 years now. Oh my, really started noticing how technology was affecting small businesses and B2B SaaS wasn't really a thing mm -hmm. just even 10 years ago, if you can believe it. So, mm -hmm. uh, I, I was really interested in that space and started to explore startups in that area. I launched a few mobile apps in the area for B2B on the SaaS um, with a SaaS model, and that um, led me to Riptide. So Riptide was a networking tracking app for small business referral groups. And if you think about industries that are more legacy industries that need that tech, uh, tech influx, uh, referral groups are definitely one of them. So I had done a lot of networking in my previous days, saw the need there and um, really went through the whole lean startup process of creating, creating this product. So going through the customer development stage, having an MVP, um, getting user feedback, really trying to follow the whole process and uh, had that um, in the works for Oh gosh, how long? Uh, I think it was about a year or so of it being live where um, uh, I was approached by another company who was doing something similar and they acquired the my company in order to continue with their um, their uh, additional bigger bigger vision for it. So that was that was my that's that's the short version. <laughs> I want to drill down on the lean startup. Define that for me. So, yes. So the lean startup process, it's where you build, measure and learn. And so it's this cycle of creating something, testing, measuring, and then and then um, using those learnings to create a better product. So it's very cyclical. 
And it's a way, so many founders, and it's it's sort of a fallacy of everyone who has that idea and they want to see that idea into the world, but they don't realize that maybe their particular product or solution is actually needed by the market at large. That's actually one of the biggest reasons why startups fail is there's no market need. So instead of spending your life savings to realize that you're never gonna have more than five customers for your product, why don't you instead learn more about your target customer's problems and solve an immediate need and build a business from there? So it's really taking your strengths um, and instead of applying it to this big project at first, it's taking these little steps to confirm and validate along the way and pivot and making sure that the product that you that you are releasing into the world is something that people actually uh, find value and hopefully will pay for. And how, how long did that process you just described take at Riptide? So for Riptide, I, it was probably about a year and a half between the, I have an idea to this is available on the app store. So a lot of people try to rush the process, but as part of that, there was a lot of customer discovery that I did, a lot of customer interviews. I actually made um, one very hard pivot prior to even releasing a single line of code. So the sooner that you can make those decisions before you hire a developer to write even a single line of code, that's the cheapest time to change your mind and change your direction. So went through that pivot, um, reassessed, um, created an MVP, which is a very uh, low tech, representation of your idea, just, but just, it doesn't just, look pretty. To clarify, yep. I never like to assume anybody sure. knows anything. That's the old newspaper mm -hmm. verse to me. So MVP, minimum viable product. Minimum viable product. So your minimum viable product is not just a scaled down version of your big product. It's a, it's a certain feature that you're testing with your audience to see if that solves their problem. So mm -hmm. it's the value piece that's really important. It's not just a, an ugly looking web page. It actually has to provide value. So mm -hmm. I went through the process of creating the MVP, um, worked with um, several networking groups uh, around that MVP, got feedback, and then that's what determined which, which features actually went into the final product that was launched on the app store. What stores. was the hard pivot you described? What, what was that exactly? Sure. So what I originally thought was the biggest problem that uh, um, small business owners who rely on referrals have is that they, they're they around people all the time who may be in need of their product or service. They just don't know it yet. And this was pre, pre-COVID when uh, people were still free to roam around and um, go to coffee shops and everything. So um, so the idea was more around um, geolocating people who are in need of your service and using um, the GPS and um, beacons on your phone in order to find people who could use your services and vice versa. If you were in need of, a, say, a small business attorney and one walks into Panera, wouldn't you like to be able to have that introduction? So the hard pivot was that that actually wasn't uh, a real need for what, what the small business owners wanted. And also from a technology side of things, this is when people were starting, when the app stores and um, phones were starting to crack down on privacy. And so if I had gone with my initial mm -hmm. Uh, idea, uh, my product would have been uh, removed from the app stores promptly about maybe six months afterwards. So um, that was something that I was glad that I made the pivot because one, it wasn't a need. And then two, the technology ended up not being available for privacy reasons going forward. Let's jump ahead to your exit. I, I want you to tell us, this is, a, this is like what they ask um, basketball players after they've won the big game or any anybody in a, in a sport, which is describe that feeling. How did you feel when you when you proved you were so great, as they say in sport? <laughs> Well, uh, well, first, no one will ever mistake me for a basketball player because I'm five foot three. <laughs> but if I uh, put on my empathy uh, hat, um, I think it was so it's it's 
sort of bittersweet because on one hand it was validating what I already knew that I was providing value, that this was a need in the marketplace and that someone else saw that value. Um, on the other hand, it is still something where you look at, uh, it's this, this is thing that you have been working on day in and day out for so long to let that go. I, I've never been the person who considers my startups to be my baby. I always look at them as they're the monsters that live under my bed and they're waking <laughs> me up. At and so it's more like just, I'm, I'm trying to keep these little monsters happy. That is such a great analogy. <laughs> so I just, and, and I have a three-year-old and I'm like, I don't know. Well, maybe, well, sometimes he is, he can be a little where monster. The wild, just but, think about uh, where the wild things are and you get the picture. Right. There you go. Yeah. There you go. So it was, it was definitely bittersweet. I, it, um, it, it was just a, a big validation point for me and seeing how I had gone through this process and it worked for me showed that I can use this process for other businesses of my own or for other companies as well. And so that's what led me into working um, at an executive level for um, a no-code enterprise database startup. I did that for about a year and then moving into more of the leadership role for Founder Institute. Okay, so let's talk about Founder Institute. Um, tell us a little bit about the background and then, then we'll get into the details of how the program works, but, but what's the history of it? Sure. So Founder Institute is the world's largest pre-seed accelerator. We work with the serious founders who just happen to be in the earliest stages of their journey. And that's actually a place that I know very well. We work with founders who have an idea on the back of a napkin, maybe some early revenue, but there's still a lot of those foundational pieces that need to be put into place. We have been around for 13 years now. We were based in Silicon Valley. We have about 200 chapters now worldwide. So at wow. any given time, we're usually recruiting for about 80 to 90 chapters. Mm. Um, and uh, I run, um, along with my co-director, we run the Colorado chapter for Founder Institute. So um, we're a virtual program now. We used to be in person, but COVID changed that. So it's a virtual program. Um, and then out of that role, uh, Founder Institute brought me on full time as the head of accelerator growth. So I work with our 450 local leaders around the world to help them run the best programs they can. And I'm also a stakeholder advocate. So stakeholder advocate for our founders, for our mentors, for um, investors who are affiliated with the early stage startup space. You know, one of the things that's, that I've learned in my brief time in the startup space um, is that accelerators have all kinds of different business models. And when I spoke to you initially, um, I learned that uh, you actually get, you know, some skin in the game very early. You get warrants to, in, to, uh, to startups that, that you can convert into stock down the road. Um, in fact, you said to me that you are, you consider yourself, or you usually are the first person to invest in a startup in the, at least in the Denver area, I guess the Denver chapter. Yes. So explain exactly what that means. What is the, and it's sort of like, tell us the business model of the accelerator. I, I find that really interesting. Oh, awesome. It is a very unique model. And uh, if, if, if you have worked in the early stage startup space, it's very, very difficult because your customer has no money. So how do you make a business off of someone who has no money? Mm. So we have a two pronged approach to generate revenue for Founder Institute. And one is we have an entrance fee. And that is so that our founders have that monetary skin in the game as well. Um, it's very hard to value what you don't pay for. So we have founders pay that fee. Um, they have access not just to our core program, which we're talking about today, but also all of our post-grad programs to help them raise their funding round and be connected to investors at large. The second prong, and this is what you were referring to, is we ask our founders to provide a warrant 
for their company. So a little different than equity. Um, Warrant sounds super scary. I have these conversations with founders all the time. They think they're going to jail. No, a warrant is actually a good thing. Um, It's actually, uh, we're very founder friendly in that way. So we find that by having a warrant in our companies that it aligns everyone's um, objectives to the founder's success. We don't make money as a company unless our founders succeed and have this wild and crazy, wonderful exit. So we have to continue to help them after our four month program in order to achieve that. So uh, the um, so uh, as part of that warrant, of course, Founder Institute receives part of that. Our mentors receive part of that warrant as well. And then myself as a local leader. Uh, I get a, sh- a share. So mm-hmm. our local leaders are not paid. We are paid in the equity re- we receive from those warrants. So explain or tell us what the fee is and also tell us uh, uh, if you don't mind explaining what a warrant is, that probably would be helpful too. <laughs> sure. So our fee varies depending on the market. Uh, it's usually about, it's usually under a thousand dollars. So when you look at other programs, it's very reasonable. Um, and especially considering all the resources you get, and that's a one-time fee for access to everything. Mm-hmm. A warrant is similar to a stock option. So stock options are between a a company and an individual where you are um, giving someone the option to buy stock at a later date, usually for a better price than what the stock is offered for at that time. A warrant is a stock option, but instead of it being between a company and an individual, it's between a company and another company. So it's still, we are, you as a founder are giving Founder Institute the option to buy your stock when you have a, um, a liquidity event at a, later. At a set price, so, right? at a price, predetermined price. At a set price, right. Right, mm-hmm. so in other words, if you say the set price is a dollar, the liquidity event event puts the shares at ten dollars. Then you you you've got a good deal there for yourselves, right? Is right, that, right. That's yes. basically the okay. So that's now let's correct. talk. Let's talk mm-hmm. about. Um, you know, I think it's important because I think you know it does sound like you're going to be arrested if you get a warrant. So, <laughs> no, <laughs> it's it, it, yeah. The industry needs to come up with a better term yeah, for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so. Um, I want to talk about your, the other hat you have on is head of um, accelerator growth. And my guess is you've grown a lot recently uh, at Founder Institute, but what are you, how, what's, what's your job in the sense of what do you actually do to facilitate that? So it, I really look at myself as being a um, customer experience, uh, more of the CCO, chief customer officer. So um it's a, a mix of marketing and then also user experience. I do a lot with uh, helping our local leaders on the re- on the recruiting side of our programs. So we um, are trying to not just find every founder out there to go through our program. We want to find the high quality founders to go through our program. So it's working with some um, marketing strategies there. And then on the CX side of things, the customer experience side of things, it's making sure that our technology and how we interface with our local leaders is the best it can be, um, that our mentors have a good experience for the program, and also uh, that our investors who are connected to the network, that they are having a good experience as well. So it's multifaceted. I, I live between talking to people. Again, that's that customer discovery side of things, but also on the product development side, because I take what I'm learning, um, what I'm learning from all of these stakeholders and then working with our development team to create the technology to actually implement those solutions. Sounds like you're the chief iterator. You keep iterating. You keep... Uh, uh, yes, uh, iteration. Oh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you, are, yeah, you are the iterator. Um so what I, what I'm also interested in is um, how you how your accelerator founder institute interfaces connects with investors. I'm assuming that somewhere in the bowels of your uh, of your somewhere in the bowels of the cloud. That doesn't sound right, does it? But somewhere in the mm-hmm. cloud, 
um, there's a database of, of investors who you've worked with in the past or know about and so on. Um, I'm assuming that's sort of a central resource for you, but how do you how do you make sure you're reaching out to the right investors? Because to me, one thing I've noticed is sometimes it seems like, you know, people, um, accelerators have lists. Everyone has a list of one sort or another, right? Out it goes. Um, it may not be relevant at all. To, you know, the things that I look at, um, now I'm not a, I'm not an accelerator, though I have a show called The Accelerator. I guess I am an accelerator, not like you, though. But, but what I look at is just obvious things. You know, someone has a company in East Asia and they want to expand from one country to another. And there are VCs that are in East Asia, <laughs> you know, say in consumer, pro you know what I mean? It's like, to me, it's like fairly obvious or like a Brazilian, I put together a Brazilian entrepreneur, pardon me, a Portuguese entrepreneur with a Brazilian because they both speak the same language. I mean, Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, so anyway, how do you manage that? How do you manage to, to keep the investors interested, happy, and investing? Right. So for a very long time, this was a very manual process because it, you're right. It doesn't make sense just to give someone a list of 500 contacts and say, here, you figure it out because investors all have a different thesis and they all want to be introduced at a different time or they're looking for different founders, depending on what stage their portfolio is at. So it's a very dynamic process. What we are doing is, uh, so we have that problem. We're also noticing, and I'm, I'm sure many of your listeners are seeing this too, that the financial and fundraising realm is starting to get a little shaky. So we're seeing that mm -hmm. Uh, with some, I mean, there's lots of doom and gloom out there on the horizon, and that is infiltrating into startups and especially early stage startups. What we're seeing, though, is that a lot of that information is misguided. And so early stage startups, it's still a really good time to launch your company and to raise money. There is still a lot of money available. So how do you mirror, how do you connect all of these things together? Mm -hmm. What Founder Institute has done is we are we're in beta right now so we are a startup ourselves right so we are in beta with a product called the fi venture network and our and the fi venture network is a formalized process of connecting those investors who are interested in investing in early stage companies with our graduates. So they know um, through that connection that they are getting in at the earliest stages and sometimes helping to write that very first check for our founders. Um, but they're getting a, a list of essentially pre-vetted companies, companies that have gone through our program, mm -hmm. are incorporated and have all of their ducks in a row. So that's one way where we are able to make those connections at scale. Like I said, it's still in beta, but that's the direction that we're heading. Um, that must be good because I wrote it down. So uh, that's, that's my, <laughs> I'm like, oh, FI Investor Network. But I think it's worth reiterating. We're talking to Diane Bailey. She is the head of the uh, co-head, I guess, of the Denver chapter of uh, Founder Institute and also head of accelerator growth at Founder Institute, which is worldwide. And you are a, um, an accelerator that, in, that uh, helps companies right at the beginning, right? Right at the, you know, the pre yes. seed, like you can barely have an idea. You can take it to Founder Institute. The, the fee that you charge is not onerous. Um, and I'm, you know, whenever I hear somebody who's kind of struggling for an idea, I'm going to send them to you because. Oh, that's awesome. Well, thank you. Yeah. I'm happy to talk to anybody. Yeah, yes. because it's, you know, it's, it's just hard to find the right fit because if you go to an accelerator that is uh, further, further along the road, so to speak, they're just not going to be able to help that person. They're not going to want to help that person. Um, and they won't know. No, they, they'll have no idea how to do it. So I think, I think this is really good to, good to know. And um, I'd be interested also to hear more about the FI Investor Network. But I want to close. We've got a few minutes left. I want to close, um, Diane, by asking you about success stories. So um, I always like to hear about great new companies. Um, and I'm mm. curious if there are any um, either, you know, very close at hand or, or uh, graduates even that you're particularly excited about. And maybe one that's sort of going down the past path toward an exit or toward, you know, that, that next round. Um, 
Uh, so what can you tell us about what you're excited about? Sure. So uh, again, with the early stage, you have to wait a while in order to start seeing some of the some of that hard work paying off. And it definitely is for several of our founders. We have one grad from four years ago. I was not the their director when they came through the program. Um, their company is called Atomo Space, and it's very cool. They create space tugboats. So when you look at on the earth, there's the logistics challenge called the last mile. So it's getting getting your package the last mile. They're doing the last mile, but up in space. So very cool. They raised a round of funding last year. They have landed several contracts with NASA and other um, government agencies. So very, very cool uh, startup there. I also have a founder who's currently raising their round on WeFunder. He's in the fintech space. So um, very excited for for him. What is that? I'm what right. Is, I'm tell, tell us about the WeFunder. What that company is, so people can go find it if they want. Sure. So the company is called GZI. It's just the letters GZI, and essentially they are creating investor algorithms for. I mean, anyone can now buy these algorithms, and it's mostly in the biotech space. So. Uh, very, very smart founder. And uh, so really excited um, to watch him. He's in the process of closing, closing his WeFunder. So that's really, really awesome. Uh, I am about three weeks away from graduating or, or, or finishing our, our, my third cohort. So really awesome founders in my current cohort. They all have really solid business ideas. Uh, I have two companies in the concrete space, which is very interesting, and then have some SaaS, SaaS businesses um, and some others. So uh, I think for me, the success too is not just seeing someone close their round. I, I get really giddy when someone comes to me and says, Diane, I just landed my first contract mm -hmm. or Diane, I got a call with an investor and they want a follow up call. So it's all of those small right. wins for right. me. Those those end up being bigger successes in my book than some than than going out and raising the big round. The rounds are a means to an end. It takes all those small wins to get yeah, there. You have to remember you're trying to build a business, not just raise money. I think people. People right. lose sight of that. So you've got some founders that say, guess what? Guess what, mom and dad? I'm in the tugboat business. That's the <laughs> bad news. The good news is it's in space. <laughs> right. Yes. <laughs> and uh, and or I'm in the concrete business. That might be a slightly harder Harder sell, though I did learn. Uh, that harder sell is that a pun? Pun intended. Harder sell. <laughs> well, unfortunately, I didn't intend it, but <laughs> I couldn't help it. Um, no, that's that's all very interesting. I think that um, uh, it it. I think in particular, when I hear you talk, Diane, I think maybe you have a bit of a sweet spot for um, for SaaS because that's where you come out of. I, I get the sense that you really have yes. a great feel mm -hmm. for that, and so on. Well, listen. Um, I want to thank you so much for being with us. Um, we've been talking. Thank to you, Diane Bailey. She is um, got a lot of titles. Uh, uh, I guess co-head of the Denver chapter. Is that the right way to say it? Or head of the Denver yeah, chapter? Co-director -co for the Denver, yeah, Denver, Colorado chapter. Yeah. Founder Institute, also head of Accelerator Growth at Founder Institute. You said what? Four hundred and fifty accelerators around the world. We have two hundred. We have two hundred uh, chapters around the okay. world. I work with our four hundred and fifty local leaders oh, okay. who run those chapters. Okay. Yep. So I work with the other directors. Yep. I like to miss. I like to miss by an order of magnitude when I'm wrong. But <laughs> but but anyway, um, it's a big it's a big operation. It's a big deal. She's a successful entrepreneur herself, and uh, we've been oh, well, thank you. really happy to have her on uh, the accelerator today. So thanks for being with us, uh, Diane. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Have a great day. I, I want to remind our listeners and our viewers, for that matter, that we, um, uh, you can reach me at Michael Conniff on Twitter at M-I-C-H-A-E-L-C-O-N-N-I-F-F -F at Twitter or on LinkedIn, of course. And my website is michaelconniff.com. This is The Accelerator with Michael Conniff. That way I get to say my name over and over uh, for reasons that are not clear. <laughs> or too much ego. Too much ego, not enough marketing. But uh, uh, thank you for being with us, and uh, we'll be back with another podcast before you know it.